Hello, this is Scott Dahman of Power World Corporation. In this session, we will discuss generator and area real power control. We'll talk about scaling megawatts in the case, also the control of generator megawatts, generator cost models, area interchange control or imports and exports from one control area to another, modeling megawatt transactions between areas, and how simulator can handle areas that belong to multiple islands that are connected only by DC lines or completely unconnected. The megawatt output of an individual generator in a case can be changed either manually through several different means of interacting with the case or automatically through automation, automatic generation control. Automatic generation control can be done with participation factor AGC in which one or more generators within a control area all move together uh, according to a weighting or a participation factor in order to make up for changes in the megawatt needs. Economic dispatch, which dispatches units according to the equal lambda criteria or where the marginal costs of all the units are equal. Area slack bus control, which in which one generator, uh, one generator bus within each control area is designated as the generator bus to make up all of the slack for the area. Injection group area slack control, in which an injection group, a uh, group of generators and or loads can be specified to move in order to make up changes, or the optimal power flow control, which is like an economic dispatch with transmission constraints. Power World Simulator has a tool for scaling load and generation. It allows the user to select a group of buses to scale the load or generation at. And you can select them individually or select them by selecting their areas. Both real and reactive power load can be scaled with the tool. The tool is located on the Tools ribbon tab. In Power World Simulator, let's open the sample case B7 flat. From the Tools ribbon tab, choose Scale Case. In this dialog, you can select which buses you want the load to be scaled at. So for example, here on the Buses tab, I could toggle several of these buses to Yes. I can also add entire areas, zones, or buses to scaling using this section of the dialog. So for example, I could add areas 1 to 2 to the scaling and then hit enter and it changes all of the buses in areas 1 to 2 to yes. In the same way I can also remove areas, zones, or buses. So if I wanted to remove area 2 I could do that. And there are also sub tabs for areas, zones, and super areas. In this case we don't have any super area defined. The note up here just explains that scaling is done on the buses that are chosen, while the areas and zones and super areas feature is just used to select the buses that belong to those respective objects. The buttons on the left also allow you to scale by area, zone, or injection group or owners as well. If an injection group were defined, you could select it for scaling. So when I'm ready to scale all of my buses in Area 1, I can come down to this bottom section right here and see that the buses that I selected include 360 megawatts of load and 130 megavars of load. And there's also stats on the generation 
and the shunts that are connected to the bus, which can be real power shunts, uh, megavars, in capacitors, or reactors. In order to scale the load or specify what I want to scale, I can choose a factor, a scaling factor to apply to this 360 megawatts. For example, if I wanted to scale it by 10%, I could enter a 1.1 and then click the tab button to change focus off of that cell. And then what it tells me down here is that the new value, if I scale it with a factor of 1.1, will be 396 megawatts of load. I can also specify a megawatt value in this box right here. In if instead of 396 megawatts, I wanted 400 megawatts, I can enter that, and then if I hit the tab key or do something to change focus away from that cell, it will update the other one and show that a 400 megawatt load would correspond to a scaling factor of about 11%. The checkboxes down here allow you to specify how the megavars are scaled and whether or not to scale out of service loads. By default, it's going to scale the megavars by the same factor that it scales the megawatts. So if I'm scaling the megawatts by about 11%, it's going to do the same here for the megavars. But if I want to scale the megavars differently, I can just clear that checkbox, and then I can independently specify megavars to be scaled. So for example, I could scale the megavars to 150 if I wanted, which would correspond to a 15% scale factor but I'll go ahead and check that box again which will revert it back to the same factor as the megawatts. I can also choose to have the scaling tool scale the generation as well so that the ACE or the area control error will be constant. If I do that then when I'm ready to do the scaling it will scale up all the generation in the same areas that have the load scaled in the same proportion so that the ACE will be constant. If you don't check this box, then you can just simply scale the load and then solve the power flow case and then the generation will change according to the AGC setting for the control area. You can also choose to scale only generators and loads that have their AGC field toggled to yes. And then you can also choose to enforce the generator limits during the scaling if the generation is being scaled or to ignore them and just scale the generation up beyond the megawatt limits if it is necessary to do so to meet the scale factor that you specify. When I'm finished specifying and I'm ready to scale, I can click either the Do Scaling button or the OK button. The Do Scaling button will perform the scaling without closing the dialog, so you can make further adjustments if you wish. But either one will perform the scaling. So. If I move my dialog here off to the side a little bit, I can see, for example, that the load uh, at bus 2 is currently 40 megawatts. And if I click OK and scale it, then it'll, every load uh, in that area will increase uh, by 11% in order to get a total load in the area of 400. So I'll click OK and then click Yes on the confirmation dialog and I can see that the values have all changed by 11 percent. I can also open the Model Explorer and look at the statistics for the load in the area. Area Top now has a load of 400 megawatts. Because I did not choose to scale the generation, the generation hasn't changed yet. But the next time I solve the power flow case, the generation will be dispatched according to the AGC setting for the area, which is economic dispatch, in order to meet its load. So now I've solved the case, and the load and the generation are balanced in area top. I have 407 megawatts of generation in order to account for the load plus the losses in the top area.
The slide here recaps some of the features of the system scaling display. If you choose to scale by area, zone, injection group, or owner with the buttons on the upper left hand part of the scaling dialog, this slide explains some of the subtle differences. If you're scaling by area or zone, you could select some generators, loads, and shunts that are in a different area or zone than their terminal bus. And you can also scale according to the injection group or owner by using those buttons in the upper left hand part of the dialog. Next we'll talk about the megawatt control settings for individual generators. In my model explorer if I open the generators display, I can see all the generation in my case and I can see the megawatts that each is producing and whether or not the generator is available for AGC or automatic generation control. If I right click on a generator in the case information display or on the one line dialog, the local menu gives me the option of showing the dialog. In run mode, you get a power and voltage control section of the dialog which shows some of those same quantities, megawatt quantities, for each generator. This slide summarizes some of the features of that dialog. It's important to note that generator megawatt limits can be enabled for an individual generator and then also globally in the simulator options dialog. The generator's participation factor is used with the participation factor AGC for the control area. The next tab to the right in the generator information dialog is the cost model tab. And generators can have cubic cost models or piecewise linear cost models or no cost models. The cost models are used with the economic dispatch or the optimal power flow dispatch. Generator megawatt output can also be controlled from the one line diagram with certain fields. If I close this dialog and go back to my one line, I can see in this case I have a generator megawatt output display along with this little pinwheel next to each generator. That is a generator field which allows you to adjust manually the megawatt output of a generator. If I right click on the field and bring up the field information dialog, I can see that it's specified that there is a delta per mouse click of one megawatt. If that value is zero, then the pinwheel goes away. If the value is non-zero, then it allows you to interact with the case by changing the generator's megawatt output by clicking on the, uh, the pinwheel. You can also use the display in the Model Explorer to manually change a generator's output. If you change the generator's megawatt value manually, then it's important to note that the generator will be taken off of AGC unless you change the setting in the Environment tab under the Simulator Options. Simulator is normally going to assume that if you want to manually specify an exact megawatt output for a generator, that you do not want the AGC to then alter that generator's output. If you do want the generation to be altered by the AGC, then you can just toggle that field back to yes or change the setting in the environment section of the simulator options. The slides summarize some of the features that we just discussed about the generator costs, changing the generator megawatts from the one line diagram, or changing the generator megawatts from the case information display inside the Model Explorer. 
Generator cost models can be expressed either as cubic functions or as piecewise linear functions. With the cubic function, the operating cost is modeled using this equation. The cost for unit i is a function of the power generated from unit i. That function includes some fixed components as well as some components that depend on the output of the power at unit i and the fuel cost, which is the FC term right here. And there's also a variable O&M term which is added. The fixed cost components comprise an a, a component that is independent of the fuel cost and expressed in terms of dollars per hour, and then also a term which is dependent on the fuel cost but independent of the power generated, which is expressed in mega BTU per hour. The total units for the function are dollars per hour. The other coefficients inside the fuel cost um, multiplied term are expressed right here. And the fuel cost and the variable O&M are expressed right here. If I switch back to simulator, and open the generator information dialog. I can see these figures on the cost tab. Inside the model explorer, I can also view specific case information displays that deal with generator cost models. If I expand the group for generators under the network group, I can see that there's a display for all cost curves, for cubic cost curves, and for piecewise linear cost curves. If I open the display for cubic cost curves, I can see all the generators in my model that have cubic cost curves. And I can also see the specific coefficients that deal with the cubic cost terms. This slide summarizes the cubic cost model display. Generator costs can also be modeled as piecewise linear. If I right click on a generator and go back into the information dialog, and then back to the cost tab, I can choose to use a piecewise linear cost model uh, for any given generator. So I'll change the model to piecewise linear here. And now what I can do is specify a curve with breakpoints. You can use as many breakpoints as you wish. To insert a breakpoint, I can right click on this part of the curve and choose to insert a point. And let's say for the first block of megawatts, I want a price of $7.62. Uh, $7.62 per megawatt hour, I can all, then uh, insert a new breakpoint, say 200 megawatts, and give it a cost of $10 per megawatt hour. This is similar to how generator bids are modeled in a competitive market. The one requirement is, though, that the cost function must be strictly increasing. So as the megawatts increase, the dollars per megawatt hour must be monotonically increasing, or each value must be at least equal to the value that precedes it. If I want to save these changes without closing the dialog, I can click the Save button. If you're using a piecewise linear model, the marginal costs are expressed entirely within the piecewise linear cost curve. The fuel cost and the variable O&M are still visible and you can change them. If you do change them, then Simulator will bring up an information dialog asking you if you would like to scale the piecewise linear cost points by the same amount that you've just scaled the fuel cost. So you can choose yes or no. Either way, the marginal cost will only be expressed by what's in the piecewise linear cost curve and not by what's in the fuel cost. That just gives you a tool to scale these values accordingly if you change the unit fuel cost. 
the fixed costs determine the cost of operating the unit at zero megawatts. They also do not impact the marginal costs, but do impact the total cost in dollars per hour of operating the system. This slide summarizes the cost dialog if you're using a piecewise linear curve. This slide shows graphically what a piecewise linear cost curve looks like. The breakpoints are shown down here in megawatts. And at each breakpoint, the marginal cost can change in dollars per megawatt hour. And the slope of this line is then equal to the dollars per megawatt hour that are specified. The fixed cost is shown here as the cost at zero megawatt output. The vertical axis then represents the cost of operating the unit in dollars per hour. You may similarly specify a linear load benefit input curve for loads in the system. However, the load benefits must be strictly decreasing in slope so that the first unit is the most valuable and then as load is increased it becomes that the marginal benefit of the load must be decreasing. I can also view the load benefit models in simulator. If I right click on a load and bring up its dialog. I can then click on the OPF load dispatch button and choose a piecewise linear model. The, again, the load benefit curve must be strictly decreasing. So as the megawatts go up, the dollars per megawatt hour have to go down. And there's also a case information display inside the Model Explorer that reveals the linear benefit curves. If the benefit model is set to piecewise linear, then the curve can be adjusted. And as far as the linear curves for the generators go, once you create a, a piecewise linear curve, for a generator, you can look at the display for the cost curves linear under the generators and view the parameters for the generator also. So here's my curve expressed in breakpoints and in the price corresponding to that breakpoint. If I right click on a generator in the Model Explorer or on a one line, I can also plot several different cost curves. There's an input output curve, a fuel cost curve, an incremental cost curve, and a heat rate curve. So if I open the input output curve for this generator, it will show my piecewise linear curve that I've specified and also the present operating point which shows the megawatts that I'm generating and the input output value in mega BTU per hour. This slide describes each of the four different cost related curves that you can plot for each generator. This slide shows the options that come up when you right click on the generator in a one line diagram and then also a sample of the input output curve. Just like with the reactive capability curves, the generator cost curves are not stored in the raw file or the EPC file format. You can, however, send them out to a text file format or simulator's auxiliary file format to be able to read them in later. If I want to save the cost curves for all of my generators, I can go to the generators display 
in the Model Explorer, right click in the display, and then choose Save As. Auxiliary file, only fuel cost information. Then I can uh, provide the name of the file and then click Save. And then I can read that file into this case at a later date or read it into a different case entirely. Next we will discuss Area Interchange Control and AGC. For the Area Interchange to work, the option box for disabling the Automatic Generation Control on the Simulator Options dialog must be cleared. If the box is checked, then all area interchange control will be handled at the island slack bus, and each individual area will not be able to enforce its interchange. Area interchange is set for each area in the area records display or in the area dialog. To view the area dialog, you can right click in a case information display or on the one line local menu. I'm going to reopen the B7 flat case because we made some changes to the load in the scaling and also to the cost curves. So to reset to the original case, I'm just going to reopen B7 flat without saving the existing case. I can open the Model Explorer and then go to the Area Records. and then right click on an area and show its dialog. The dialog shows what type of AGC control is being used for this area, in this case economic dispatch control. The info interchange tab shows some summary about load and generation and then also about the interchange or the exports of megawatts from the area. In this case, each area is not exporting anything, but the local generation in each area is completely meeting its own load. So there are no exports for any control areas. The next couple slides also show how to access this information. We can also view the same information in the Model Explorer. For this case, each of the three areas is set to economic dispatch control. Let's switch to the one line diagram and then from the tools ribbon click the single solution to solve the case. And I want to also use our difference flows tool to set the present case as the base case and then we can experiment with different control options to see how the dispatch changes. If I change the load in area top by disconnecting the load at bus 2 and then resolving the case, I can see that only generation in the top area changed in order to meet the different load. The generator at bus 6, which is in the left area, and the generator at bus 7, which is in the right area, did not change because each area is responsible for meeting its own load in this case. And if I switch to my difference case, I can see that opening the generation at bus 2 caused the unit at bus 2 to drop 20 megawatts, and the unit at bus 1 to drop 2 megawatts, and the unit at bus 4 to drop 17 megawatts. That is according to the economic dispatch control. So switching back to my present case, I'll place the load at bus 2 back in service and resolve the case again. I can go back to my area records display 
in the Model Explorer and change the top area from Economic Dispatch to Participation Factor AGC. I also want to check the participation factors of each of the generators in the top area. So I'll switch back to my Model Explorer and go to the Generator tab. And if I scroll over to the right, I can see that each generator has a participation factor of 1. The participation factor is just a weighting that determines how much that generator moves in order to make up for a change in megawatts in its area. The generator will move in proportion to its participation factor divided by the sum of all the participation factors of the generators in the area. So if I make a change to load, for example, changing the load at bus 2 by 30 megawatts up to 70 megawatts, and then if I resolve my case, I'll notice that each generator in the top area moved up by an equal amount. If I go into my difference flows can look at the difference case, I can see that the generator at bus 1, bus 4, and bus 2 each moved up by 10 megawatts in order to meet that increase of 30 megawatts. The slides recap these examples. In addition, we could change the generator costs and see how the other generators in the area respond. Here's the example that we did for the economic dispatch. And this describes the, the example that we did for participation factors. And note that when you're using participation factors, the cost information is not used. Each generator moves according to its participation factor and the participation factors of the other generators in the area. And here are the details of the example that we did with the participation factor control. Another area control option is the area slack bus control. This is the method of control that's normally used when you open a case in the raw file format or in an EPC file format. The area slack bus is not the same as the island slack bus. The island slack bus is sometimes called the swing bus and it is used in the inner power flow loop to balance the power flow set of equations. The area slack is used in the megawatt control loop to balance the ACE in that area. The area slack bus basically means that there's just one bus in the area that is responsible for all for making up the power for all generation load and losses in that area. It's basically the same as setting the participation factors of all the generators in the area to zero except for the bus or except for the generator that's at the area slack bus. And that one gets a non-zero participation factor and thus becomes the only one that's able to move. You might also choose to use the injection group area slack control. And in that case you can specify a group of generators and, lo and or loads in an injection group that becomes responsible for making, making up power due to changes in generation, load, and losses in that area. In that case, the participation factors associated with each participation point in the injection group determine how much each element in the injection group moves. In the example that we looked at so far, there weren't any megawatt transactions between areas. Each area is responsible for meeting its own load and losses. But you can also specify that one area export power to other area as well. Multiple transactions may be entered for each set of areas too. There's a transaction ID field which separates the different transactions. And then you can also enable or disable each individual transaction. And transactions may also be 
determined by economics of the optimal power flow, which is covered in the training session on optimal power flow. In Power World Simulator, I'll switch to the Model Explorer. And then under Aggregations, I'll call up the Megawatt Transactions. To insert a new transaction, I can right click in here and then choose Insert. And let's say that I want to export from the area top to the area left 50 megawatts. The transaction ID is shown right here as well. And if you want to change the transacting areas, you can do so from the drop down box. I'll go ahead and click OK on that, and then it adds a transaction to the list. I'm going to also insert a transaction from area top to area right, also in the amount of 50 megawatts. I can also view these transactions in a matrix form by clicking on this tab that says matrix, matrix of Transactions. Here the exporting areas are shown in rows and the importing areas are shown in columns. So the amount right here of 50 megawatts represents the export from area top to area left. I can also view this information on each area's information dialog. If I switch back to the area records and then right click on area 1 and bring up its dialog, I can see on the Info Interchange tab that the total transaction megawatts is 100 because I have 50 going to each of the other two areas. Down here I can see that I'm exporting 50 megawatts to area left and 50 megawatts to area right. Each of these transactions can also be enabled or disabled with the toggle flag right here. Because I haven't solved the case yet, I can see that this area has an area control error of 100 megawatts or negative 100 megawatts. When I solve the case, then that, that should go to zero or at least within the AGC tolerance that is specified for the area. Each area can also have a transaction that goes just to the rest of the case without the other area being specified. That's known as the unspecified megawatts here. And generally when you get a public case, uh, a NERC case from in, in the raw file format, a lot of times a lot of the areas will have interchange specified as the unspecified megawatt amount. It's important to make sure that the sum of the unspecified megawatts for all of the areas in the case sums to zero. Otherwise there'll be an unbalance in the amount of megawatts that are exported and that'll show up as an error in the area that contains the island slack bus. I can also see interchange information in the Model Explorer under Area Records. If I scroll to the right, I can see the total scheduled megawatts, where the positive values represent exports and the negative values represent imports. The actual interchange, and then the area control error, which is just the difference between the two. And again, when I solve the case, then this should be driven to zero. And then at the right, I have the column for each area's unspecified megawatt interchange. And again, it's important to make sure that this sums to zero for each electrical island. If I solve the case, then, by clicking the Single Solution button, I can see that the interchanges now match the scheduled megawatts, or at least within the uh, AGC tolerance, and the ACEs are all driven to zero, or at least within the AGC tolerance. If I look at the one-line diagram, I can see that as well. In area left, 
I am generating about 50 megawatts less than I am uh, than my load because I'm importing the rest from area top. And the same thing occurs in the area right. It's also important to note that areas that have transactions going between them must be on some form of area control like participation factor, OPF, economic dispatch, or area slack. If one of the areas is turned off control, then that area will not be able to match its obligation and the difference will go to the island slack bus. The next few slides describe the example that we just did. Here's the megawatt transaction display, which again can be showed either in a matrix or in a list. In the area transaction dialog, which we saw when we inserted the transactions from the area transaction case information display. It's noted here that the transaction amount is specified uh, in this first cell, which is the one that we modified in our example. You can also specify a minimum and a maximum amount to the transaction and then allow it to be governed by the optimal power flow. The details of using that will be covered in the optimal power flow section of the training. It is possible in Simulator 13 to have area control for areas that span multiple islands. Prior to Simulator 13, any area that spanned islands was automatically set to the AGC off. However, Simulator 13 has a few additional features that allows some situations in which areas can span islands and have some sort of uh, AGC control. The graphic here illustrates situations in which areas that span islands can be on control or not on control. On the figure on the left, Area 1 spans three different islands, but only Island C contains more than one area. In this case, AGC is allowed for Area 1, even though it spans multiple islands. On the figure on the right, Island A and Island C each have multiple areas. In this case, AGC control is not allowed for either Area 1 or Area 2. The reason the area control is not allowed is because if you've got a transfer between Area 1 and Area 2, there's no way of determining whether or not that transfer should occur in Island A, Island B, or Island C, or some combination thereof. The next section describes how you can convert heat rate data into the cost information that can be used in PowerWorld Simulator. So a lot of times for different power plants you might have information on the heat rate curve and that would be described in terms of mega BTUs per megawatt hours for each uh, level of megawatt output. And then you might also have some fuel cost information expressed in dollars per mega BTU. To put the information into simulator, you need a total cost curve, which then is expressed in dollars per hour versus megawatts. This slide shows an example of heat rate data, where at different levels of megawatts, you have different levels of heat rate. Graphically, the heat rate information might look like this. As the output of the unit goes up, the heat rate comes down. We might say that the plant is more efficient at higher levels of megawatt output. To convert this information to an input-output curve to use in simulator, you can multiply each point 
on the vertical axis by the megawatt output. So the heat rate times the megawatt output at x1 is shown here on the vertical axis and so forth for each point. Now the output is shown still on the horizontal axis but the vertical axis shows the input in megabtu per hour. If we then multiply the megabtu per hour times the fuel cost in dollars per megabtu then we get the cost in dollars per hour on the vertical axis. We can also add in a term for variable O&M cost. The result is a piecewise linear curve with slopes given by this equation at each breakpoint. This curve is in the proper form to be used by simulator for the piecewise linear cost model. The breakpoints are given by x1, x2, x3, and so forth, and then the associated marginal costs in dollars per megawatt hour are given by the slopes. If you want to use the same data but enter it as a cubic cost model in simulator, then what you need are the parameters in addition to the fuel cost and the variable O&M you need the A, B, C, and D coefficients. This equation here is of the form that we saw earlier when we looked at the cubic cost models. So in order to use an equation of this form you would need to curve fit the piecewise linear input output curve to determine these coefficients. For this type of heat rate data, it might be easier just to use the piecewise linear model because that's the form that the, that the uh, equations are in to begin with. It's also worth noting that the optimal power flow uses a linear program to optimize the generation dispatch and internally it will always convert cubic cost curves into piecewise linear cost models anyway. So if you have the data to begin with in a piecewise linear curve, then it, you might as well just enter it that way. Uh, because that would be how it would be used internally uh, by the optimal power flow. The piecewise linear curve also mimics the bids or offers that are presented to an ISO in a competitive market. And this slide again shows how the earlier curve matches up with the piecewise linear inputs. For generators that have a minimum megawatt output associated with the bid, this slide shows how to set that output and then also how to enter a fixed cost accordingly. And this slide just recalls that piecewise linear generator models and load models must meet the convexity requirement. What that means is that for generator costs, the slopes must be increasing with each increasing breakpoint. A decrease in slope, as shown here on the right, is not allowed. For loads, the benefit curve must be decreasing with each increasing megawatt output. An increase in slope, as shown here on the right, is then not allowed. This concludes this session on area and generator megawatt control. If you need further assistance, please feel free to look us up on the web, give us a call, send email to our support line, or if you prefer to work with a particular PowerWorld engineer, please feel free to contact that person directly.